What was an aspect of creating a show like Mythbusters that wasn't suitable enough to be on screen, but you wish more people knew about? Um, the story meetings. I really wish we could have filmed the story meetings, but I was the reason that we didn't. Um, as you could imagine, I was certainly the most vocal person in any story meeting in our in our team. Um, I get passionate about stuff. I jump to conclusions. There's lots of problem solving. But what what I mean by story meetings is at the beginning of a shooting block, uh, and we shot and we shot year round, but we shot three months on, two weeks off, three months on, two weeks off. And at the beginning of those three month runs, we would shoot a certain number of episodes, and we'd beat out the plots of all those episodes, the rough ideas of where those would go experimentally. And that's what I mean by a store meeting. It is the breakdown of each episode uh, with the whole production team, answering questions about how we're going to cover this, where we'd like to film it, what we're going to use, where we're going to need to ask for resources, how much money we might need to ask Discovery extra in order to make this build work. Um, and at one point, we thought, let's film a story meeting. And I found that I couldn't talk. Um, but really, more specifically, I couldn't curse. And there is this way in which I'm a cursor. I'm a, I'm a, like cursing is just part of the way I talk to people. And as a public personality, I don't curse often on camera because as I've said on, on Tested and everywhere else, I, I like the idea that kids watch what I, what I do. Ooh, I'm getting a package. I like the idea that kids watch what I do. Um, at the same time, I do curse occasionally because that's part of life and kids should just know that adults curse from time to time. And it's cool when we do. And when kids curse, it's just gross. I don't want to hear it. But I, in story meetings, there was a kind of a freeform way in which I would both jump into the narrative of the story, but also pull back and tell tangential stories or dirty jokes or random, random, uh, 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 <laughs> random anecdotes about stuff that I'd read in the news. And for me, that was all part of the oscillation of this writer's room we had to create at the beginning of each shooting stretch. Um, and it meant that I couldn't have a camera running. I just, I like, I couldn't let go of myself enough to kind of allow my brain to go to those places it needed to go. Um, so yeah, while I always have wished that you guys could have seen a story meeting. Um, I'm sure that some of the jokes I told back then were career ending, <laughs> terrible, terrible jokes. Uh, so I'm glad you don't see a story meeting. Um, there was another question about, ah, here we go. Uh, by the way, the last question was asked by Groves Paz, Groves Paz or Groves Paz. This next question is asked by Andrew Myron. Uh, Andrew, you've really got me with this great question, Andrew. Um, how did you guys develop such a good relationship with the people at the bomb range, the fire department, and other governmental agencies? All those experts always seem to enjoy helping out with the dangerous elements of your myth busting. Yes, they did. Um, there are a few reasons why those relationships were good relationships. One is we understood that good relationships with the bomb squads and the fire departments and the police departments was the soul of our show. Uh, and for us, we would set up an idea of like, oh, we're gonna go film this at that place. But frequently we would come to results we didn't expect and we had to change directions and go to a totally different methodology to test out the next part of the story. Well, in those cases, having a relationship with a bomb squad or a police department or a fire department that we could say, hey, can we come down tomorrow and can we expedite this, this permit process so that we can come and film? Those relationships were completely critical to us making those narratives work. And those relationships were maintained by our, again, I'm forgetting some of our most important producers, Linda Wolkovich, just the location whisperer, Linda Wolkovich. Um, she used to run the shop uh, at Industrial Light and Magic when I was there uh, and ended up being one of Mythbusters main producers for its entire run. And Linda was a, so amazing at finding a location and then getting the people at that location to fall in love with us as a production crew. Uh, and then the next time you call them and you say, can, can we do this thing like in two days instead of three weeks, which is the normal permit time? And they'd be like, yeah, come on down. So that was one way. 
Another reason we had great relationships is that bomb squads are all Mythbusters. Yeah, I know you might think that Mythbusters was an was an honorary bomb squad, but I'm here to tell you that all bomb squads are Mythbusters. So um, bomb squads are composed of uh, 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 these seasoned professionals who have to learn how to deal with something they don't know what it's going to be. They don't know who's going to leave a bomb somewhere. Might be some, you know, buddy finding. Quiet, you. There might be somebody finding grandpa a grenade grandpa brought back from Germany uh, and they took it to the police station. Or it might be some dumb kid made a pipe bomb. Or it might be that someone really wants to blow someplace up. They have to be able to respond to all three of those situations in the safest imaginable way. So what do they do to do that? They are constantly training. They are constantly training under all sorts of different different contingencies to learn what happens. They set fire to cars to watch how they burn. They blow them up to watch how they blow up and learn what different explosives do to stuff. In that way, they're constantly testing different methodologies and learning how things work, which is exactly what Mythbusters was. So whenever Jamie and I would meet a new bomb squad, whether it was at the International Association of Bomb Technicians and Investigators annual meeting in Louisville, Kentucky, which we went to once, which was amazing, or we were at Matsu County Bomb Squad up in Alaska, or the Alameda County Sheriff's Bomb Squad uh, headed by J.D. Nelson, who was effectively like the seventh Mythbuster, that bomb squad. Um, we Every time we met a bomb squad, we found people we felt super simpatico with in terms of that... Uh, in terms of that mindset of the kind of contingency planning problem solving that we were doing. Um, and the last reason that we had good relationships is we left every location we filmed at better than when we found it. I can say that unequivocally. Uh, we were able to dig up the runway at Alameda, which you're not usually allowed to do, but we repaired it in a way that was perfect. And, and we did it on the up and up. We, we we broke things and paid for them to be fixed. Um, but in general, we left every location we filmed at better than when we found it. And that is a testament to the whole ethos of our production team. So early, early you guys asked me about the unsung heroes of Mythbusters. That ethos of uh, getting the job done but also making sure that these relationships were maintained and that these locations were maintained. Again, we're in not just California, but Northern California, San Francisco Bay Area, one of the most environmentally restrictive areas of the country for all these terrific reasons. But it also meant that when we wanted to do stuff as simple as like dumping 10 gallons of, of, of vegetable oil on the ground, we had to jump through some of the most surprising hoops in order to be able to do that. Uh, and the fact that we were able to execute that in every way that was environmentally safe and sound and uh, considered, you know, exactly what was needed by all the experts we worked with, that ethos permeated the entire production. Um, I, one more question. Uh, excellent. Should I just pick from this list? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have time for one more question and this comes from fix it, Tony. Um, Fix It Tony. So I was thinking about your username, Fix It Tony, because when I had a Fiat and the Fiat that I owned was a um, Spider, a Fiat 2000 Spider. Yeah. So uh, that was, a, I had two of those. I had a 1977 and a 1980. And the Fiat Spider is a freaking great car. It is, that is a terrific car. You want a little two seater, Jazzy little sports car for just a few grand. Get yourself a Fiat Spider Man. They are awesome. But the reason I'm telling you the story about the Fiat is because everyone says it stands for Fix It Again, Tony. Um, and I'm here to say that was not my experience with the Fiat Spider. And later on, I had the Fiat Ed Barth, and I loved that car. Um, by the way, when you're talking about two seater sports cars, one of the great things about the, the that mid '70s Fiat Spider is it was a better driver than any of the other sports cars made around that time. Better than an MG, better than the Datsun, better than the Carmen Gia. I love the look of it, but man, it's a murder! It's a murder vehicle. There's no engine in the front. Um, all of those other cars, the MGs, the Alphas, they you have to drive them like you're angry at them. But the Fiat was the most modern of those cars back in the mid '70s. I haven't even gotten to your question. Sorry. Fix it, Tony. So I found myself wondering, Fix it, Tony, if you have a Fiat and there's some like internal joke going on with your username. 
He wants to know how many different myths were you working on at the same time? It seems like you may have had a few at different stages of completeness and one ready for showtime. Um, thank you, he says, and my patron experience is very positive thus far. Well, thank you. I am really glad your patron experience is positive. That That's our goal. Um, we had anywhere from probably two to five or six myths going at any given moment. Um, what were the drivers behind the numbers? Well, you always need a backup plan in case it rains and you're supposed to shoot outside. Um, so it behooved us to have stuff to do that we could fill in in case we lost days to, to weather or other production contingencies. Um, there were also stories that took huge amounts of time. Um, so in general, we had, wow, we had the best schedule in television for the longest time. We had like 12 shooting days per episode. Yeah. So right now, if there are any people who currently work in reality television for one of the big, you know, Nat Geo or Discovery, uh, and you actually have a TV show, you're you're looking at the camera going, 12 days of shooting per episode? And the answer is yeah. When Mythbusters first became successful, Jamie and I found ourselves in the position of having the power of being the stars of a show that was successful. And it's a weird kind of power because you can call up the head of the network, but you don't want to waste his time. You don't want to be like, I need, you, you don't want to start using that power indiscriminately. So the only thing that we did with that power was we pushed our schedule out. So we had more time to shoot because the more time we had to shoot, the better the stories were. And yeah, by the, by the time we were done, it's 12 shooting days per episode. At one point when we renegotiated a contract, Discovery said, we got to hand it to you guys. Cause we were asking for less episodes per year. Discovery was like, no one's ever asked to do less episodes per year. And we're like, no, we, we want more time to make less episodes because they'll make them better. Um, all that being said, not every episode took 12 days. Some of them took months to come to fruition. Lead balloon is one that took a year and a half to find a factory that could roll lead thin enough for us. A uh, 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 rocket car, the three times we did a rocket car, there were so many pieces that were, that were contingent on expensive pieces coming in. So we would work in a very bulleted fashion. Okay, we're going to work the first half of this week on that on the uh, uh, rocket car episode, and then we're going to do the second half of the week on the polishing door dungo. So we would often oscillate big stories and little stories, exterior shooting stories with in-shot shooting stories, so that we could have that room to move. Um, a good producer always has a plan B, a plan C, and even a plan D. Uh, and our producers were the best, so we always had those those. Then there were times in which we would plan to do something and it would fail so spectacularly. What is the, well, lead balloon is, is one in which we had two false starts. Uh, we had companies that agreed to roll the lead thin enough and two separate times those companies broke their equipment the day before they were supposed to deliver the lead to us. So there were two separate times on lead balloon where we showed up Monday ready to film an episode and we had to start filming a completely different episode. And again, that's also where that film experience that Jamie and I had so much of really comes into play is like, it's not just, well, here's what I love about the problem solving under that kind of contingency. Um, let's say I'm making this car engine uh, for a film. The amount of detail I can add to this is effectively infinite. I could spend an infinite amount of time making this look perfect. I could take every logo and take a picture of a real engine and match the paint job on every single one, but that would take years and it would be the most beautiful thing you ever saw. But I can get this to 90% in a day. And how I do that is by knowing what you are and aren't gonna see, knowing what your eye is and isn't gonna be drawn to and knowing what things to throw out of that process in order to get it done in that right period of time. And that mental process of constantly weighing your options, chucking some out and keeping some in order to, again, hit that mark of 5 p.m. delivery on set. I just love that mental process. It feels so good to go through it. It really does. And like I said, film, that's what film is all, film, commercial, reality television, all of those disciplines are all about that, that mental process. Um, 
you guys, I didn't expect such a deep dive this week into my old job, but I really appreciate it. It has been um, five years since we wrapped Mythbusters, uh, late October 2015, or was it early November? I think it's I, it's it's within a couple of weeks of the November uh, October November uh, switchover uh, back in 2015. So it's been five freaking years, um, and I, I I really appreciate this time to talk about it. Your guys' questions were awesome. There was at least three or four of these questions I have never heard before, and I've spent much of the last 20 years answering questions about MythBusters. So that's a real achievement. Thank you, guys. Thank you, tested patrons. Thank you, everybody else, for watching. Stay safe. Take care of each other. And I will see you, as always, next time.